Queridos amigos, uh, dear friends, we are going to have this session in English because we have some speakers from other countries, but everybody understands the language. The first speaker is Professor Juan Tamargo, who is a very well-known pharmacologist uh, from Spain. Please, Juan. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to add to thanks to the society for giving me the opportunity to be with all of you this afternoon. I must say that I have a very serious conflict of interest and is I'm a pharmacologist. And uh, I have a very simple uh, slide that is, for me, the most important one. This is the situation in Spain. We have around a million people with atrial fibrillation. And even if I'm dreaming, and I accept that you perform 3,000, 3,000 ablations per year, and this is not true, the situation is that less than 1% of the people with atrial fibrillation undergoes non-pharmacological treatment in our country. And the question is, what to do with the other 98, 99% of patients? And the second question is, what to do with those that remain in atrial fibrillation after one or more ablations? And the last one is, what about those who are not suitable for atrial fibrillation? And the answer is quite simple. What we must do is to prescribe antiarrhythmic agents, even if I know that they are moderately effective and they can produce serious adverse effects. And from this point on, I would like to stress that in many patients, uh, safety is much more important than efficacy. Uh, the main problem for me is that atrial fibrillation is an arrhythmia that can appear in, as you can see, in some patients, probably in 10 to 30% without evidence of cardiac disease. But if you look at this, most of our patients they present atrial fibrillation, and they also present acute cardiovascular causes. Particularly, they present comorbidities. Uh, this is a mistake. It's 40 to 60 percent present uh, uh, hypertension, coronary artery disease, 25 to 35 percent, and from 4 to 50 percent present heart failure. So it's quite clear that these patients that you see every day in your clinical practice, these patients present different comorbidities. If they present different comorbidities, they present different substrates, and therefore they need different therapeutic strategies. So the famous one-size-fits-all approach is doomed to failure, and that's what we are doing every day. And the second one is, as a consequence, treatment should be individualized. And if we want to perform a primary prevention of atrial fibrillation, it's quite clear that we need an earlier and more active management of all the comorbidities that precede atrial fibrillation that I present in you in this slide. But the title of my talk was, what is new? Well, new is electrical remodeling, yes. A structural remodeling, yes, I hear a lot this morning. But I didn't hear a single word about uh, autonomic nervous system remodeling. I'm going to present some data if I have time for abnormal calcium handling. And I would devote three slides to what we are doing in our daily clinical practice, because we are not following what the guidelines said that is indicated. Uh, well, the general idea, and this is what everybody believes is the gold standard, is uh, these are patients. This is from our lab. This, are, this is an, an actual potential for a patient, a patient without atrial fibrillation. This is a patient with chronic atrial fibrillation. We have a program, uh, six years long at the present time, with the Hospital Gregorio Marañón. And as you can see, a patient with atrial fibrillation present, chronic atrial fibrillation present a very marked shortening of the, action, uh, of the uh, atrial action potential duration. And this uh, shortening, you can see that is independent of the driving cycle length. Interestingly enough, I like very much the, this paper from Frustacci because he changed my mind almost 20 years ago. These were patients with low atrial fibrillation. According to the echo analysis, these patients do not have a cardiac problem. And these patients, when they perform, Frustacci and co-workers perform a biopsy, they found that there were fibrosis, there were hypertrophy, there were mononuclear infiltration, this means inflammation, and there was ischemia. So we thought that all patients with atrial fibrillation, they have a marked shortening of the action potential duration in the atria. And this is true in patients with chronic atrial fibrillation, as I already presented to you. But please note that this is absolutely not true, depending on the comorbidities of the patient. If you deal with a patient with heart failure, he has not a shortening of the atrial action potential. The atrial action potential is normal or is even prolonged. 
The same can happen in patients with mitral valvular disease. And please note that the marked differences in the expression of the different cardiac ion channels. And we are giving a single compound for all these people. And we want to obtain a success, what is absolutely impossible. So it's quite clear that it's not expected that the same compound it is not expected that the same compound is effective in all patients. Well, I'm a pharmacologist. Here you have a huge number of compounds that has been proposed in the last, last 10 years. Please note that there are some compounds that have been underlined. These are the compounds that at the present time are in clinical trials. The other compounds are compounds that work very nice in mice and rats, but I don't know anything about what they are doing in human beings. Nevertheless, you see there are a lot of compounds, and I just want to deal with, I'm not going to talk about ranacalan, somebody's going to do it. I'm not going to talk about ranolacin, somebody's going to do it. I'm going to talk about a, a trial that I'm involving, it's the first proof of concept trial. Look, uh, there is a current, there is a current that is present in the atria, but is not present in the ventricle. This is the ultra-rapid component of the delayer rectifier potassium current. And this current, we thought, that could be a beautiful target, therapeutic target. Well, as you can see, this, uh, this is... Oh. Excuse me. This is uh, what you obtain in a, normal, in a patient in sinus with. You can see that this compounds shorten the action potential duration, but in atrial fibrillation, they prolong the atrial action potential duration, and they do not do anything on the ventricle. So minimum risk of ventricular proarrhythmia. As you can see, here you see uh, these compounds produce a dose-dependent increase in atrial refractoriness, no effect on the, on the ventricle, and this compound is at the present time uh, on, on a study in 200 patients. They have an implantable device, so we are going to measure atrial fibrillation burden. Uh, there are also compounds that are very very popular at the present time, and are compounds that are able to modulate currents that are only in the atria, and particularly that are expressed in patients with chronic atrial fibrillation. This is a, what happens if you activate a potassium current that is activated by acetylcholine, and as you can see, there is a progressive shortening of the atrial action potential duration. So, we believe that some patients have an increase in parasympathetic tone, and this can collaborate to the shortening of the action potential duration. And these effects can be reversed, as you can see, with this compound that at the present time is also on the clinical uh, trials. But let me do what we have been doing in the last few years in our lab. The first thing we found, please, is note, is that, and this is the only study I just want to stress this. It's the only study where we pick a piece of the left atria and of the right atria from the same patient. So we have been very lucky. We were the first in performing this type of experiments. Please note that distribution of the channels are different in the left and in the right atria. And what is much more important in patients with atrial fibrillation, the distribution of ion channels and currents changes. Furthermore, we found that there are some currents, this one, that does not play any role in patients in sinus rhythm, but they markedly increase in patients with chronic atrial fibrillation. And what is important for this current, uh, is the, 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 the slow component of the delay rectifier, is that this current is sensitive to isoproteronol. And so we thought, if we have a current that is significantly increased, what happened with the neural remodeling of the atria of the patients. It's very simple. You can see that in patients with chronic atrial fibrillation, there's a marked increase in the density of beta adrenoceptors. Please note the marked increase in terminal endings, sympathetic terminal endings. And what is important for me is that this current, we studied this current in a few years ago, almost 20 years ago. Uh, and this current, the, the slow component of the delay rectifier, is significantly reduced by flecainide and buffer. And these are the two compounds that are selected for the cardioversion, pharmacological cardioversion of patients with atrial fibrillation. Another interesting point is we mentioned changes in neuronal uh, innervation. Look, this is what happened. These are very recent data from our lab. 
please note what happens if you stimulate, stimulate the sympathetic tone in the atria in patients in normal sinus rhythm. Isoproternol prolongs the cardiac action potential. What happens if I stimulate sympathetic tone in patients with atrial fibrillation? What happens is that markedly shorten the action potential duration and I hyperpolarize the resting membrane potential so that now this patient has much more abilities of multiple reentrant uh, wavelets. The second topic is many years ago, 20 years ago, as you can see, we know that atrial fibrillation presents a lot of changes. Please note that I just fibrosis is in the middle of everything. It's just to remind you that the patient not only has fibrosis, but many other things in the atria. See, this is, suppose that you are not expecting that anything can recover this. This was, sometime, was a normal atria. And so it's very easy to say, drugs don't work. Drugs cannot work in a, in, on this myocardium, okay? So there is an electrical and structural remodeling. And there are many factors. You can see ischemia, hypertension, heart flare, mechanical stretch, oxidative stretch, growth factors, neurohumoral activation. They produce a change, so cardio, cardiac fibroblast uh, move to my, myofibroblast. We have fibrosis, and we facilitate, as you can see, uh, uh, atrial fibrillation. Do we have drugs for this, for, to prevent atrial uh, structural remodeling? Yes, how many do you want? How many do you want? Many, right? Here we have uh, statins, omega-3 uh, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. As you can see, inhibition of the running angiotensin system. We have a lot of compounds. But if you go and read December 2014, the guidelines on the other side of the Atlantic, you can see that ACE inhibitors and uh, angiotensin receptor blocker are reasonable for primary prevention of new onset atrial fibrillation only in patients with heart failure or reduced left ventricular uh, ejection fraction. Uh, should be considered for primary prevention of newly onset atrial fibrillation in the setting of hypertension. Statins only on, uh, in atrial fibrillation after coronary surgery. And of course, therapy with ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and statins, uh, as you can see, are not beneficial for primary prevention of atrial fibrillation in patients without cardiovascular disease. And the question is why we fail. And it, for me, it's quite clear we move too late. Atrial remodeling extended to this. This is the normal atria. This is the atria we are trying to reverse. So we move to a, a, to a point where the reversibility is, is not longer possible. The second is the ignorance of which patient we should target. And uh, so for me, uh, I think I have something to convince you that we are too late. And this is the page, this is the, you know pretty well this, this study from Swedberg. This is, oh God, this is in patients with class, NIHA class two patients, and you can see that the plerenon, we live early enough, reduces drastically, as you can see, the incidence of atrial fibrillation. And the same happened with ramipril in patients with hypertension. So our problem is that we deal with the patients too late to reverse structural remodeling. Uh, do we have something new? Yes. Here you have two recent, two recent compounds. Probably are not, you are not familiar for these compounds, but if you speak with somebody like an uh, odontologist or somebody interested in pulmonary fibrosis, they will recognize pretty well tranilas and pilfenidone because these are compounds that are used to prevent fibrosis in human uh, beings. And you can see here that, of course, if these compounds, you can see that prolong the atrial effective refractory period, decrease the number of the inducibility of atrial fibrillation, and you can see in this microscopy that reduce markedly the fibrosis. The last point is what about calcium handling? And wow, how many targets do you want? Well, we have a lot of targets. Here we know that there is a decrease of the L calcium entry through the L-type calcium channels. We know there are changes in the rionidine, this overexpressed. So calcium that is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum moves to the cytosolic uh, area, and we have a marked increase in intracellular calcium, and you can have beautiful uh, uh, after depolarization. We have changes in circa 2 and phospholamidin and many others. We have compounds also. We have compounds. And some of them, we are prescribing these compounds every day. Please note, 
beta blockers are able to modulate, we know this for more than 25 years, modulate circa two, circa two channels. You know, here we have ranolacin, here we have beta blockers, we have calcium channel antagonists, so we have a lot of compounds uh, to deal with these uh, alterations in calcium handle. My last few slides. It's very easy to say, particularly those devoted to use devices, drugs are dirty drugs, I don't like it. Fine, fantastic, completely agree. My first slide said, these compounds are not what I want. They are poorly effective and they produce important side effects. But please help the patient and help the drug. This is just what happened in the Eurospa. 20% of people use for cardioversion drugs that are not recommended. So I would expect they cannot get nothing. Second, I uh, have been dealing with the patient up and down, up and down, two days, six days, eight days. After eight days, Vernacolan is an excellent compound. If you give it properly, 78% of conversions. If you wait eight days, it's not different from placebo. And second point, please, are you sure that it's an atrial fibrillation and not an atrial flutter? Because this compound is not effective against atrial flutter. Second, this is fantastic. Paper published December last year. This, as you can see, only 300,000 patients with atrial fibrillation. In the other side of the Atlantic, Please note, please note that 45% of the antiarrhythmic drug used in patients with heart failure and 31% of the antiarrhythmic drugs used in patients with coronary artery disease are not accepted in the guidelines. Are not accepted in the guidelines. So is the failure of the drug? No, it's my failure because I have been prescribing a drug that's not working and it's not indicated. And my last slide. This is a beautiful study supported by the European Society of Cardiology. Uh, my friends present me the data, I say, hey, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, 36% receive, receive dicoxin. It's a contraindication. It's an absolutely contraindication. My explanation is that they don't want to have patients in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. They want them in persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation. It's the only explanation for that, right? So this is my last slide. Atrial fibrillation, as you can see, drugs are here to stay. Adrenaline drugs remain the first drug therapy for all muscle patients with atrial fibrillation. I'm sorry, uh, I told you I have a, a, a bias. I'm a pharmacologist. <laughs> Despite we gave them, the, we said modest efficacy because we gave it late to the wrong patient. And please, recurrence is not equal to failure. Recurrence can be accepted, and it's a fantastic result for some patients. If we allow atrial fibrillation to persist, it will be impossible in some patients to restore sinus rhythm. Uh, as a pharmacologist, my objective is the development of new, safer, and more effective antiremic drugs. Uh, I don't know the pathophysiology of atrial fibrillation, so how can I go to develop new compounds? It's very difficult. Atrial fibrillation is a complex condition associated with multiple <coughs> etiologies, mechanisms, and comorbidities. So different comorbidities means different substrate and different therapeutic strategies. And please, if atrial fibrillation produces electrical, structural, neural, and contractual remodeling, we must be aggressive enough in an early moment during the development of the arrhythmia. This is my last slide. It's just to think that you, you can ask me after you leave why there's a new paper published in JAK that they are giving Botox to suppress uh, parasympathetic terminals in patients with atrial fibrillation. Beautiful paper. <laughs> my problem is, do the heart react like uh, Sylvester Stallone's face? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, next presenter is Ignacio Ferreira, who is going to... who is going to talk about the evidence-based medicine in the use of Fernacaland. Thank you, Ignacio. Thank you very much. Well, I would like first to thank the organization for inviting me to talk about this topic. Uh, I will start first talking a few minutes about the rationale of a neon drug. We then move uh, 
about the, uh, to present the pharmacological and pharmacokinetic properties of vernacular land, we then focus on the clinical efficacy, specifically the phase two, phase three, and phase four of clinical trials with vernacular land. And finally, of course, what's about, what about the safety with vernacular land? Well, as you know, atrial fibrillation is likely the most prevalent arrhythmia in developed countries affecting between one to two percent of the overall population. And the management of patients with atrial fibrillation is, main, uh, uh, is, is, is to, to get uh, a control of symptoms and also to improve the quality of life. In this sense, there are two strategies, that, as you know, the reading control strategy, which is aimed to maintain the sinus rhythm and to prevent recurrences, and the rate control strategy that is mainly aimed uh, to maintain an adequate ventricular response. But recent evidence suggests that uh, both the strategies could be equivalent in, term, in terms of overall survival, and this, this could be due mainly because of the poor safety and poor efficacy of the available antiarrhythmic drugs. In addition, antiarrhythmics could eventually be the unique option. There are many patients that could not be eligible for the rate control strategy. Of course, there is all, always the option of electrical cardioversion, but it requires a deep sedation and a fasting state that would not be very well tolerated in many patients. And finally, most pharmacological alternatives, it requires a delayed onset of action over 60 minutes and they also have potential prearrhythmic effects that could eventually increase the mortality rate and to prolong hospitalization. So it's understandable the research, the investigation of new antiarrhythmic drugs in this context with this scenario. Bernacaland is a natural selective multi-channel blocking blocker affecting potassium and sodium blocker uh, channels. Its main antiarrhythmic effect is by blocking a specific subunit of the sodium uh, channel. It leads to a redu reduction in intracellular calcium, which eventually leads to a reduction in the rate of delay after depolarization. And this is one of the main explanations, apparently, for the low proarrhythmic effect with vernacular. Bernacolan is associated with a greater efficacy in fibrillating atria, mainly because its action, its action is enhanced at a faster rate, but also because uh, Bernacolan has many atrial myocardium targets. It's also associated with a lack of QT prolongation and a low incidence of torsades. And concerning its pharmaco pharmacokinetic properties, Bernacolan is not affected by gender, AIDS, hepatic and renal function, it's metabolized by the usual uh, pathways, and it's clearly almost equally by liver and kidney, which leads that uh, it's half uh, life uh, ranging is from three hours to uh, eight hours, very short, which uh, obviously is, is good. Let's now focus on the clinical efficacy, the clinical trials concerning vernacular. There are phase two, phase three, and phase four clinical trials. Well, the efficacy of intravenous vernacular for cardioversion of recent onset atrial fibrillation has been assessed mainly in three clinical trials. They were called the Arrhythmia Atrial Cardioversion Trials, ACT-1, ACT-2, and ACT-3 trials. The ACT-1 and ACT-3 were very similar in their design. They were both double-blind, placebo control phase three clinical trials in which patients with recent onset atrial fibrillation from three hours to 45 days were randomized to intravenous vernacular versus placebo. Patients were further stratified according with the, uh, the, the duration of the atrial fibrillation and the primary endpoint, it was the same. The proportion of patients in the short duration of atrial fibrillation who had finally converted to sinus rhythm. There is also the ACT-2 clinical trial that is some special because it was mainly aimed to assess the efficacy of intravenous vernacular, but in the post-operative period after cardiac surgery. 
There is also one phase four clinical trial, but it was an open label clinical tri trial that it was mainly aimed to assess the, the safety of vernacolan. It's worth to mention the AVRA study. It was a double blind but active control clinical trial comparing vernacolan with intravenous amiodarone. And finally, the SCIN2 clinical trial, also a double blind placebo control clinical trial, but specifically in patients with atrial flutter. So, what about the results? Bernacalan did show benefits concerning the conversion to sinus rhythm within 90 minutes in recent onset atrial fibrillation. In the pool results, the rate of, to conversion, uh, uh, of conversion to sinus rhythm increased by eightfold in the Bernacalan group comparing the amiodarone and the placebo group. In fact, the pool efficacy for conversion to sinus rhythm, it reached 44 percent patients in the vernacular group versus 5% of patients in the control group. If we exclude those patients included in the Ebro clinical trial, with these patients were treated with amiodarone in the control arm, then the risk ratio for conversion to sinus rhythm was 7.6 times higher with vernacular and comparing placebo. Characteristically, the situation was completely different in patients with atrial flutter. In this population, in this target population, vernacolan did not show any effect, apparently. And what about the oral vernacolan? There is only one clinical trial, a randomized placebo control study for the prevention of atrial fibrillation recurrences. It is a phase 2B clinical trial in which three doses of vernacolan were tested against placebo. The main aim point, the average time for atrial fibrillation recurrence, it was 90 days in the vernacular group, in the highest dose of vernacular group, versus almost 30 days in the placebo group. After three months, almost half of patients in the vernacular group still maintain the sinus rhythm comparing 36% patients in the placebo arm. And finally, the lower doses with vernacolan did not show superiority comparing placebo. Of course, very important, the clinical safety with vernacolan. We can uh, say that <coughs> vernacolan has adverse events, but they are mild in nature. Paresthesia, dysgeusia, sneezing, and nausea are often adverse events associated to vernacolan use. Mainly the most frequent one is transient hypotension that could eventually reach 7% of patients. There was one death possibly related to vernacolan in the ACT-3 clinical trial. It was a 68 years old man with severe aortic stenosis in whom vernacolan was given within the first 30 days after an acute coronary syndrome. Vernacolan is associated with only a small increases in QRS. There is not a principal effect on QT corrected, not associated to heart failure, and occasionally has been described ventricular ectopic beats and even ventricular arrhythmias, monomorphic sustained and non-sustained ventricular tachycardias. If we pull the effect, the severe adverse events uh, altogether, we can see that vernacolan is not associated to a higher risk of serious adverse events comparing placebo or amiodarone. It's just the opposite, a minor benefit with vernacolan, although it did not reach a statistical significance anyway. So, the important, it's very important to know that more patients discontinuated the drug in the vernacolan group comparing placebo and amiodarone. And this was due apparently to hypotension, bradycardia, and to non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Please note that vernacolan has not been tested yet in patients with very low ejection fraction, nor in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In addition, vernacolan should not be given in patients with a low systolic blood pressure, not if an acute coronary syndrome occurred in the previous 30 days, 
not in patients with advanced heart failure, not in patients with severe aortic stenosis, and not in those patients with a prolonged QT and corrected severe bradycardia or advanced second and third degree atrioventricular blocks. Finally, there is not experience in those patients receiving vernacular, sorry, uh, antiarrhythmic class one, three, before uh, vernacular. So, if I have to conclude, I would say that there are positive conclusions concerning vernacular ter therapy. In fact, current available di data so that vernacular has a good efficacy profile in terms of the rate of conversion and time to conversion to sinus reading. Bernacaland, intravenous Bernacaland has been approved in many European countries up to date. In general, the safety profile is pretty good and the most common adverse events are mild, mild in nature. But there, is, there are also no, not so positive conclusions. Bernacaland is contraindicated in many clinical conditions that are usual, such as hypotension, acute coronary syndrome, advanced functional class, Herfila, severe aortic stenosis, QT interval prolongation, and bradycardia or advanced uh, block or atrioventricular block. In addition, I would say that it would be deserve more experience with intravenous vernacaland. Up to date, only a few hundred patients has been included in clinical trials. And finally, there is not uh, Compar um, other comparisons or comparison with vernacular with other antiarrhythmic drugs, excepting amiodarone, intravenous amiodarone. And uh, this would be desirable also. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ignacio. We are going to have the questions at the end. I'm very happy to present. Professor Juha Hartikainen from Kopio Hos uh, Hospital in, he in, in Kopio in Finland. He's going to talk about real life experience with vernacular advantages in, of its use in the EP lab. Dear Chairman and dear colleagues, uh, first I would also like to thank you for, for inviting me to, to Alicante and this, uh, this meeting. I've been here before, not uh, as a cardiologist, but as a tourist. I remember the first time, very first time, many, many years ago, I was with my friends having an interrail trip. So we stayed overnight here and, and then continued to Cartagena and uh, La Magna for scuba diving. But today, no more about scuba diving, but now we'll deep, go deep into the issue of atrial fibrillation in the EP lab. Uh, first of all, uh, in Finland, I know that in, in, uh, this is the scenario so that you are doing an EP study and the patient gets atrial fibrillation and, and uh, you would like to get rid of the atrial fibrillation. Maybe it's a patient coming for the for the, your EP study or ablation because of atrial fibrillation, but because you want to handle the substrate, whatever you are doing, you would like to get rid of the AFib. I know that in many countries there is a handicap that that's, you cannot cardiovert the patient by yourself if you need to, uh, anesthesia, but you have to ask for the anesthetist to come. It will take some time. In Finland, and, and if I understand it correctly, also in Spain, you can do it yourself. So it's not an issue in, in our lab. So if, if we have a patient with AFib, we want to cardiovert, we want to put the patient, the patient into sleep, that's fine. We can do it by ourselves. But there are certain occasions when we want to avoid to anesthetize the patient or to do electrical cardioversion. Okay, then in those cases, we have an option that um, Either we, we do DC cardioversion or use some antiarrhythmic drugs. So first, why we would like to avoid uh, DC cardioversion and anesthesia? The first is that in, in, KN, in normal cases, if we just do traditional EP study without mapping, um, without electro anatomical mapping, then usually we anesthetize the patient and we do DC cardioversion. But in cases, patients where we do detailed mapping, 
with electronic systems, then as we all know that, that if the patient moves, then there is a risk that we have to restart the, the mapping uh, from the very beginning. And all the time when we, we do DC cardioversion patient is, is in, under anesthesia, it's jump up and get down and, and hopefully the, it's safe landing so that the patient lands in the same position where he were uh, airborne. So if there's a shift, then there's a risk that we have to restart the whole thing. Uh, in addition, when we, we put the patient into sleep and the patient wakes up, as we know that the patient is quite often a little bit drowsy, doesn't follow our advices and orders, can be groaning and, and, and moving, and that's also, it will take a few minutes, and that's also a risky time, so that there is a risk of patient movement. So in those cases, we would like to uh, avoid anesthesia and, and DC cardioversion. Uh, then there is a time factor. So if we do anesthesia, you know, it takes maybe five minutes to, to organize everything, put the patient into sleep, then usually you can continue once the patient is really awake. So quite often it will take 10 minutes or something to do the anesthesia, DC cardioversion, and then the patient is really recovered from the anesthesia, and then you can continue. So if we would like to have some very neutral, very modern antiarrhythmic drug which would be available, could be used, then you can continue your, your procedure, especially if you are doing PV isolation. You can do the line and continue, and if, if the patient will be cardioverted, then you can continue in sinus rhythm and check the line. We know that all of us would like to do the, the, uh, the, the ablation during sinus treatment. You can do it during AFib, but, but you would like to finally confirm the block of the line uh, in, in sinus treatment. And you can continue ablation without interruption if you have a potent drug who can, which can do the cardioversion. Okay, then which antiarrhythmic drug? So one thing is, is to, uh, if the drug will affect your, your target, your substrate you are heading for. In this case, we have a patient with WBW, you see nice delta waves. And if you give the patient flaconite, that's in this example, this is a really old slide 30 years back, you see that there's a partial temporary interruption of the conduction through the pathway. So if you are heading for the pathway and you kill the pathway temporarily, then you cannot, there's a risk that you have to stop the procedure. So you would like to have an antiarrhythmic drug which doesn't influence your target, your substrate you are, you are looking for. Uh, from the same study uh, uh, where the ECG was coming from, you see this uh, table. You see uh, there are 12 patients uh, on the left side of the panel, there is a contour situation, the refractory period, and then the patients were given flaconite, and six out of 12 patients, there was a block of it, uh, undergrade conduction through the pathway. And in one of the patients, retrograde conduction was blocked. So obviously, this kind of drug is not suitable. It's not a good uh, drug uh, used uh, in these patients. Uh, this is an example from our lab, so it's a patient with atrial tachycardia with a cycle length of uh, 450 milliseconds. The patient got a FIB, was cardioverted with Werner Kaland, recovered sinus rhythm, and after that, very soon, the atrial tachycardia could be induced again. You see that it's a little bit slower, 530 milliseconds, but still it didn't affect the in in inducibility. So you can restart the... Uh, it's a tachycardia. That's a good thing because you are heading for the, for the tachycardia. So, uh, as I said, that if we do traditional ablation, we do DC cardioversion, but in many cases, in, in difficult cases, let's say patients with uh, atrial, uh, with the uh, accessory pathway, for example, uh, we do mapping with the electron adenotrope mapping system, with the, we are using CARTA system, so we would like to avoid DC cardioversion. And in those cases, we have thought that maybe we could try at least the Werner Same is true for um, uh, PV isolation. Uh, then we have some patients, we all just for fun, we tested in patients with uh, uh, AVNRT who got AFib, said that 
instead of using DC, we tried vernacular and a few patients. Then AFL means HR flutter. It doesn't mean that cardio version of HR flutter, but we were heading for isthmus block. Patient got AFib. We wanted to get rid of atrial um, fibrillation, but not touching the isthmus zone. So we used vernacular, and also we have a few patients with atrial tachycardia. But a majority of the patients with, with AFib and PV isolation. So altogether about 100 patients. And now I will show the results. So uh, in patients with PV isolation, about 60% of AFib was terminated with vernacular in in, uh, in the rest of the uh, indications about, let's say, 40 to 70 percent, but the numbers are very, quite low, so that on average you should say that about 60 percent of AFib was uh, converted to sinus rhythm with using vernacalans. Uh, this is uh, the time zone when you are expecting something to happen, so in, in 90 percent of cases the cardioversion took place within 30 minutes, which is very similar as we saw in, in previous presentations, so that, that that's true, same as in, in, in acute and emergency setting. Uh, then, could we predict which patients we can cardiovert? Remember that if now we are in EP lab, so the duration of the AFIP is usually maybe five minutes or something. It's just wait a couple of minutes whether there's a spontaneous cardioversion and then we start uh, whatever we are doing. Uh, if we take patients with successful cardioversion and non-successful, we see that there is no difference as comes to age, ejection fraction, but it seems to be that, that uh, you get successful cardioversion in patients with uh, small left atrium, or the other way, it's non-successful if the atrium is dilated in terms of diameter or area. Uh, 45, 46 millimeters is certainly already dilated, and the same is true if the area is 27 square uh, centimeters. If you look a little bit more detail, so in patients with, with normal size or let's say on the maybe upper limit of normal size but less than uh, 42 millimeters, the cardioversion rate is, is close to 70 percent. If it's really dilated more than 46 millimeters, then it, it's something like 45 to 50 percent. So these patients were divided into two tiles in this scenario. And if we uh, use the left uh, atrial area, so those with left atrial area less than 22 million uh, square centimeters, again, it's about 70% success rate. And in those with <coughs> dilated, it's, it's about 45%. So average, 57. Then just uh, uh, two examples of, of uh, pacemaker business, so if we have a patient undergoing pacemaker implantation, during the implantation, particularly if you are putting a atrial lead, you would like to see the sensing of the lead. And so it means that you would like to have the patient in sinus rhythm. Again, there is a question. The wound is open. So if you would like to put the patient in the sleeve, usually you have to cover the wound, incision, uh, place, anesthetize the patient, and then wake up the patient, and, and it will take it some time, and also there is a uh, risk of infection because the wound is open and maybe the patient is moving and not following your orders. So we thought that, okay, there might be a good chance to try at least when a Kalan, and, and then you can proceed, uh, continue procedure, put the lead and, and wait for the cardio version, and, and, and so not to interrupt your procedure. Of course, we have to remember that the success rate is something like 50%, but anyway. So just anecdotal examples to that, that, which we have done a few times. And then if you have a patient with pacemaker, if you do DC cardioversion, usually you have to interrogate the system and check the, the, the lead and the uh, box performance. So, Whatever you are using for pharmacological cardioversion, you don't have to do that. So, it, of course, in this case, you could use also other uh, antiarrhythmic drugs like flecainide, maybe amiodarone, but, but of course, amiodarone is so slow onset action. So, in Finland, the other 
alternative practical is flaconite, which is used, uh, but not as much as it could be used. Uh, in the case you know, of pacemaker patients, the success rate is, is about the same as expected, so something like 50%. So, to conclude, in pacemaker patients, so the success rate is same as in, in the big, big uh, trials, about 50%. And the advantage of using any pharmacological means, it's not only vernacular, and you could use also flaconite in pacemaker implantation uh, so that you can continue the procedure. And uh, also, I think you can reduce the risk of infection because the wound is, is uh, uh, not, let's say, in the risk of infection during the procedure if you can handle the patient properly. And there is no need for integration if you do pharmacological cardioversion. And in EP lab, so in selective patients, in patients with normal left atrial uh, dimension, the success rate is, is close to 75 to 80 percent. And it allows you the mapping, of course, not if, well, not maybe if you are having a patient with AVNRT or pathway, but, but certainly if you are doing PV isolation, then you can continue your mapping and, and, and your ablation during the cardioversion. And the patient movement can be avoided so that you don't, there is no risk or less risk to restart the procedure. And it seems to be, this is anecdotal, so that it seems to not to influence the substrate. So it doesn't seem to influence the, the pathway uh, so that uh, you can safely continue the procedure even when giving this anti-arrhythmic drug. Certainly if you give flaconite or amiodarone, you cannot do it in these settings. So uh, as I mentioned, the last thing is that it's more anecdotal. So we are actually now running a study where we use vernacellant in patients with WPW and see if there is a really influence on the pathway. And this is the last slide which was taken last week in, in Finnish Lapland where I was having my Easter holiday. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our next presenter is Miguel Quintana who is talking about granola sign expectations versus evidence. Thank you, Chairman. I assume that the majority of the audience is, is, is from this country, so you will understand me why I am going to use a few minutes of in my presentation to take, to take some uh, issues not related to Ranola sign. I want to put Torre Vieja in context. Uh, Torre Vieja is uh, a uh, little town place it uh, let's see over there and of course we don't have the Museo del Prado Avenue we don't have the um, Sagrada Familia Church uh, we don't have the beautiful churches from that Sevilla or Santiago or Burgos or all of the big cities of the country has uh, Torre Vieja has beach and a beautiful climate. And the people that resign generously, the initial mind of being, being a fishing uh, population to be converted by the madness of massive tourism in a tourist place. And these generous people of Torre Vieja is embracing every year thousands and thousands of tourists from all of the part of this country, from all part of the Europe countries, and from most part of the uh, people of the all over the world. And 
Somewhere in Torrevieja, there is a hospital called the University Hospital de Torrevieja, where a handful of crazy doctors, brave doctors, nurses, technicians, paramedical personnel is taking care of the healthcare of the massive tourism that come to us. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Moya and the organizers of the, this symposium for inviting this small hospital uh, to participate in this Congress. Because I do believe that this is more democratic and more representative for the entire community of the cardiologists in the entire country. Well, having said that, and after this political arenga, let's go to the topic. Excuse me, I have to tell you the clock yes. is running the other way around, so right. you have to talk until the number is 30, okay? Right. That's wrong. Okay. If we're going to take a Ranola sign and uh, safe uh, expectation versus evidence, we have to necessarily talk, talk to Raffaello, because so far is the largest a clinical trial uh, uh, testing the efficacy of this drug to prevent uh, uh, atrial fibrillation. And the reason to do the test are twice or double. The first one uh, that is a uh, topic of Dr. Tamargo, it has been proven that the properties of the, uh, the electrophysiological properties of the Ranola sign in the atrial cells are well, are well documented and the excitability of these cells are decreased by Ranola sign and decreasing the, 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 the prevalence or the incidence of uh, atrial fibrillation. The second reason is that a Ranola sign is an extremely safe drug as shown in the Merlin study. In addition, as you will see in this line, in this row, in the Merlin study, uh, patients uh, in the Ranola sign group had less prevalence of atrial fibrillation as compared with the placebo group. So that's why uh, the Rafael study was planned. Uh, and it's a uh, phase two dose range in the study, testing three doses of Ranola sign, low dose, medium dose, high dose as compared with placebo. And the objective of the study was to see the efficacy of the Ranola sign in the maintenance of sinus rhythm after electrical cardioversion. The study was run during four months. The primary endpoint was time to time from randomization to the first documented at atrial fibrillation episode. And importantly, a pre-specified pre uh, 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 analysis was done excluding the patient that had a relapse of atrial fibrillation during the first uh, 48 hours. And importantly, one of the, reason, the rationale of the, uh, of the study was thought, considering that perhaps 80% of the, of, the, of the patient in the placebo group could be in atrial fibrillation at, 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 at the end of the study. Well, these were the inclusion criteria, uh, male or female over the 18 years, persistent atrial fibrillation, more than seven days and less than six months, and the ability of the participants to transmit a transtelephonic uh, ECG. A lot of uh, exclusion criteria that I'm not going to, 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 to detail. Uh, well, this is just a, a, a picture of the transtelephonic uh, um, transmission of the ACGs <coughs> and the uh, study was performed, was run in four uh, European countries, among them our country. Uh, in short, 310 patients were screened, 69, 69 were uh, screen failures and they, uh, we randomized uh, 241 patients. Three patients were not treated, which left uh, 238 patients for intention to treat analysis. Among them, there were 116 recurrence and uh, 
the rest of the patients were, sens were censored at the end of the study. In short, among the four groups, placebo and the three doses uh, of ranolazine, there were no difference in clinical characteristics. I just want to pinpoint, pinpoint one fact, that the mean age in all groups were about 65 years. There were no difference in clinical comorbidities among groups, and there were no difference in echocardiographic parameters, neither on the use of uh, pharmacological treatment for atrial fibrillation means, meaning uh, angiorhythmic drugs and other drugs. Uh, this very difficult uh, dia, dia to, to present means only that the side effects were very light, like constipation, nausea, dizziness, asthenia, fatigue, and so on. And they were more present in the high dose of randolacin. However, there were no major side effects. The primary endpoint, that is, time to first recurrence was not different among the four groups, placebo, ranolacin, low, medium, or high dose. Uh, the pre-specified analysis, excluding patients with early relapse, uh, show that the group assigned to Rhinolacin versus placebo had a borderline significant difference. Notice here that the curves are all together in the beginning, but with time the curves start to um, differentiate. And at the end of the study, the number of patients or the percentage of patients in sinus with move or, or with recurrence was for ranolacin in between 58 or 60 percent as compared with placebo or low dose of ranolacin. Then we did some exploratory analysis combining the two doses, the medium and high doses of ranolacin as compared with placebo and once again we found a differentiation of the curves that did not reach the statistical significance, but they were very, cl uh, very close to do that. <coughs> and that's again, uh, the two, med the median and high dose as compared with placebo, uh, well, almost reached the statistical a significant difference. So, these are the evidence. The Raphael study did not meet the primary endpoint because no single dose was better than placebo. As we showed in the, in the, in the, in the pictures, the survival curves were superimposed in the beginning of the study, but after the first days, they started to separate. The lowest dose of ranolacin was definitely not better than placebo. However, the combination of the medium and high dose uh, show a borderline uh, significance in the, the re in the reduction of the recurrence of atrial fibrillation. This is, these are also the evidence. I just want to pinpoint this fact. Do the Raffaello population correspond to the real world population without a fibrillation? Just taking two issues. As much of you taking care of patients with atrial fibrillation, it's very rare that you, the most common patient is in the 60, 65 years old. You usually get patients in the 70s and older than that. 
And the second assumption that we have in the, in the group that we assume that 80% of the patients at four months will be in, 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 in atrial fibrillation. And in fact, what we saw was that almost uh, 40, 45 percent of patients were on sinus rhythm. That may explain that we did not uh, uh, reach a statistical difference in the four curves. And finally, at the end of this year, the last year, the preliminary results of the Hamlin study were present. This was a study uh, assessing the, uh, the burden of atrial fibrillation in patients having a pacemaker, and they were, assessed, uh, they were assigned to placebo, uh, uh, ranolacin alone, dronedarone, a low dose, or the combination of uh, ranolacin, uh, very, uh, uh, ranolacin with uh, at the metadone a very low dose or ranolacin a medium dose. And what, we, what the study shows that the, the reduction of the atrial fibrillation burden was the significant in the group receiving uh, the combination of ranolacin and low and medium dose of the dronedarone. Those were the evidence, and these are the expectations. Dr. Charles and Selevich said in the heart rhythm meeting last year that one of the drugs that, of the drug that we have available today for atrial fibrillation, those that are safe are not very effective, and those that are effective are not very safe. That is in line with what Dr. Tamargo said at the beginning of this meeting. And that means that we that are on the clinical arena have to perhaps change the paradigm of the treatment, the pharmacological treatment of the patient with atrial fibrillation with antiarrhythmic drugs, and go from the use of very potent antiarrhythmic drugs that may have the killing potential to less effective drug, but with a safety profile that is very high. In fact, after the after the end of the Harvard meeting last year, the promoter of the Hyman study announced two big phase three clinical trials. One to assess the, the burden of atrial fibrillation with the combination of ranolacine and dronedarone, and the second one to assess the combination of ranolacine and dronedarone to assess the effect of this drug on major cardiac events. So, the taking home message today is perhaps to change the paradigm of the actual treatment of atrial fibrillation with antiarrhythmic drugs from potent and possibly toxic antiarrhythmic drugs to less effective drugs but more safe drugs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to resume a little bit for those who arrived late, uh, what we have been talking about. Professor Tamargo first uh, um, emphasized that patients under atrial fibrillation have different substrates and therefore may need different antiarrhythmic drugs. He has emphasized also the need for atrial selective antiarrhythmic drugs that are not any pure uh, drugs with such characteristics and also differences in receptors in the right and left atrium. He has also reviewed the antifibrotic properties of other drugs. Dr. Ferreira has talked uh, deeply about pharmacological properties, efficacy, and safety of Bernacalan, and has raised several open questions. Professor Hartikainen has, um, has, has explained that Bernacalan does not influence the substrate for ablation and allows mapping and ablation in several different context, contexts, and um, also allows for a shorter time of PM implantation, avoiding movements for mapping. And Professor Quintana has summarized the data, the few clinical data that we have nowadays available about rhinolazine, and has also presented the first uh, data with Raffaello, has uh, emphasized the safety profile of this drug and announced uh, investigator-driven tri driven trial combining ranolazine and dronedadone. We, we open now the, the session of questions of the audience. Is there any question that you would like to ask? Uh, I would like prof to ask Professor Tamargo if he could 
advances a little bit about what, what he thinks is going to come next. What, what is, from, from those several drugs that you have presented, what do, would you believe is going to be the, the first that comes into the market? And also I would like to ask you just uh, a few comments about combination of drugs. For example, is it necessary to combine flacainite plus beta blockers, etc.? I will start with the last question. I devoted in the 90s a lot of effort in the combinations of antiarrhythmic agents. And the final conclusion is don't do it. But now we are coming back, as usual in life, we are coming back, uh, once again to drug combinations. Uh, for me, the most important point is that most of these studies with drugs, antiarrhythmic drugs, were performed in the 70s and 80s, far away from the, the present time. So I will be very, uh, a little, careful to start to mix up drugs, antiremic drugs, based on results obtained in the 80s, because the situation at the present time is different. Even with beta blockers? Uh, beta blockers for me is something interesting. Beta blockers, we uh, always said these are compounds for rate control. I do not agree, because some of these compounds, like abedilol, have been demonstrated that suppress atrial fibrillation, for instance, in patients with hair failure and in patients with, uh, with, with hypertension. And we have a lot of data, but I don't know the reason why when writing the, the guidelines, they always miss this point. But carbedilol does it. And we have several randomized clinical trials in patients with atrial fibrillation. So for me, it's quite clear that beta blockers do much more things, many more things than rate control. Concerning to the compounds for the next, for the next week, uh, for me, I trust this combination of dronedron plus uh, ranolsin. And the reason is that both <coughs> compounds are not very, very effective if you want potency to suppress things, but they are very well tolerated. And the data from, um, from the second trial, the Harmony, well, uh, it's only an abstract. It's only an abstract. But it looks nice because there was a reduction of 70% in atrial fibrillation burden. Because we are measuring not episodes, burden. So, and this is important for me. Uh, I also expect some, I, I'm expecting data from the component I present that blocks I cure, because it's a proof of concept. I'm not so sure if something is, is going to be okay or not. Because uh, we have people who believe that this is rubbish, this, this target is not my case, I just think that is the opposite. And um, for me, uh, we need to remind that drugs of the same class present very different effects. For instance, we mentioned carbedolol. It's the only beta blocker that is able to suppress the arrhythmias in patients with uh, uh, mutations related to, uh, to, to um, catecholaminergic ventricular tachycardia. Why? Because it has different properties than the other. Okay? And so, beta blockers for me is something that we need to revitalize, but nobody's interested. Nobody's going to put money to develop any, 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 any cl cl clinical trial. And the European Union said no, too. And uh, I would like to reveal re repeat the, the, the data on, to prevent structural remodeling, but with the data we have already. Selecting patients, for instance, with heart failure uh, or with hypertension. Uh, for me, hypertension is very important because hypertension is not in the hands of the cardiologist. It's in the hands of primary care, and it's a, a real problem. And for instance, the first treatment is diuretics. Do anybody in this room know what happened in a patient with atrial fibrillation when hypertensive patient with atrial fibrillation when a diuretic is prescribed, please go at least 10 years behind. And you can see they are not the best. They are not the best. So this is an example of what I would like to know. I would like to know many things, but all these compounds are uh, generics for so many, many years that nobody's going to put money on the table. That's for me the main problem. Thank you very much. I have another question for you, Dr. Okay. Tamargo. Don't you think that the, the absence of animal models yeah. for uh, human atrial fibrillation is 
one of the main problems when we try to understand atrial fibrillation, at least on the, at the beginning of the illness. We have uh, biopsies and, and post-mortem studies in yep. humans, but we need an animal who is close, re closely related uh, to the I'm, I'm human. I'm going to, to, to answer you. For the last six years, we have a lab in the Department of Cardiology of one hospital, big hospital in Madrid, in the Department of Cardiology, in front of cardiac surgery. And so, from time to time, because surgeons are very peculiar people, they are not interested in fabrications, uh, you, we get a, a small piece. We dissociate the cells right there, 10 meters far away from the, from the so, so operating room, and we take the, these, these cells and we study human cells. Because humans are completely different, so a are completely different from uh, patient, from, from animal models. Mm -hmm. And we learn for 25 years, we spend a lot of time, a lot of efforts, and at the end, the coordinates were not important in humans and so on. So, with close collaboration with, uh, and the second project we have is with six hospitals in Madrid, and we just pick the patients who have, this is not atrial fibrillation, this, sudden cardiac death associated to channelopathies. We have a beautiful group of patients and we have three families with long atrial fibrillation and we very recently described, uh, well, described not because it's, uh, we identified a mutation in a novel gene and we are very excited because these are my patients, they are close to my street. So these are what I'm interested in, very close collaboration with clinicians. And that's what I've been doing for the last 40 years. To work in the lab without contact with the clinician is dead. Please, you, you want to make a comment? I also have two questions to Professor Tamago. So in one of your slides, you show that the, the effect of isoprotonol on, on the uh, duration acting position was different in patients with, or was it animals with sinus rhythm and atrial fibrillation. So in, in sinus rhythm, it will prolong the action position and in, in AFib shorter. Is it because of AFib or because of high heart rate in the atrium? So which is the dominant thing? And the second question is, as if this is true, could it be possible that we could have one day a drug which is totally neutral during sinus rhythm? Once the patient converts to AFib, then it will start an action so that it will be without any side effects in sinus rhythm because it doesn't have any effect, and, but, but during AFib it will start it. To answer the first question is that we were very interested. I mean, I couldn't believe that five years ago there was no information on what, is, uh, what, what happened with the sympathetic neural uh, remodeling. So what we found in patients with chronic atrial fibrillation, at least six months in atrial fibrillation is, as I present you, is that the sprouting of, 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 of sympathetic uh, ending significantly increase. There is also one current that is modulated specifically by the sympathetic tone that increases at least five times. And this current is very important, particularly at fast driving rates. At fast, not during sinus rhythm. During sinus rhythm, IKS don't do anything because it activates so slowly, there's no effect. It disappears during diastole. But it's very, very, that's what we, we, we found for the first time in 1995, that it's very important at very fast driving rates. And the point is, sympathetic stimulation in a patient with sinus rhythm this has a slight prolongation. It's not a surprise because I increase very much calcium entry. So the plateau phase is shifted to positive potentials. So the action potential duration is prolonged. The point is what happened in a patient with atrial fibrillation, with chronic atrial fibrillation. There is an increase in sympathetic tone. There is an increase in beta adrenergic, uh, beta adrenoceptors. We, we, we identify the whole signaling. So I just present you beta, beta receptors, but we have a whole signal in public. And what you find at that time is that you stimulate the sympathetic tone. Now you increase a current that is not present in sinus rhythm, and this current is very important, fast driving rhythm, so it shortens very dramatically. So at this time, I can explain why there is an increase in sympathetic tone, so that is preceding the, 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 the boat of our population. Completely agree with you. This, I didn't present you the data, this is completely suppressed with carbedilol or with atenolol. So this is, a, a, this is the idea. 
I have something not for people in sinus read, because in sinus read, I'm not interested in that, that the anterior don't do anything, are in sinus read. I want something clever enough to be developed that is effective when I need it, when the, when the fast, uh, when the address is driven pretty fast. I don't want to say I have the key, but this is the starting point. We, we would like to ask Professor Hartika in an if you used Bernakalan in other contexts, as you have explained, an example, do you use it in the emergency room? And if you could give us a short uh, hypothesis about what, why do we have so few clinical data, clinical practical data published with Bernakalan outside from the clinical trials? So the question is why we have so less uh, few experience in, in real life? Yeah. Well, I think that I remember the time when it was very easy to do cardioversion with, with antiarrhythmic drugs. It was a time of quinidine when it was tablet, oral tablet. But once that was taken out from the market, we still had the flaconite, but it never became as popular as, as quinidine. I don't see any why not. So basically, maybe something you put in the, in the intravenously is something which is a little bit sounds a bit dangerous, so tablet is, is, is much easier to accept. So th at least that was the, the time of, of flaconite. So in, in Finland, it never became very popular. At the time, now the Vernakeland, it, it's coming, uh, I wouldn't say that it's very popular, but we have certain centers in Finland which are using Vernakeland quite a lot. And in many of those centers, the, the thing is that they don't have access to anesthesia, anesthesia uh, after the normal working hours, so do you have to wait to patient until next morning. So for practical reasons, if you want to do something else, just wait. Uh, those uh, centers or hospitals have used it quite a lot once they have learned to do it. The second thing is that in some remote uh, hospitals, they have uh, internists, even cardiologists, but they don't have uh, like pacemaker clinics. So if you do this cardioversion, then you have to send the patient for, for interrogation to 100, 200 kilometers away for that. So I would say that those centers which really see that there is a, that they can benefit of it, they, have, they don't have access to anesthesia or they, otherwise if they use an DC cardioversion, it means that the patient maybe have to be uh, cannot go to, to work next day because he had to visit the second hospital. Those are those who have, are quite eager to use it. But let's say those who have uh, multiple options, they can do uh, 24 uh, hours a day, DC cardioversion, etc. They are less, uh, more reluctant to, to, to try to use it. But we, we certainly have some hospitals in Finland who are using Werner Kaelan quite actively. But, but there is not, it seems to be that in some cases it's based on some rationales. But in some cases, it's more somebody is very active and just, just starts doing it. OK. Thank you very much. So I believe we have to close the session because of the time. We thank very much the presenters and the audience. Have a, a nice um, day.